So one little thing I was looking at on this Dactron here, so one R62, is also got the calibration switch in the bottom here, and no keys. So I pulled the switch apart, I've actually found a key which fits, well, kind of fits, it's the same um, key style. So I've actually got one which fits in the barrel there, and you actually see the pins that are protruding. This key is a, is a CH751, that's what's marked on it. And it's close, it's say it's almost right. Um, I'm just going to probably take the switch off and put a different switch on, because, you know, it's pretty easy to do. If you're worried about trying to maintain it and keep it original, then here's a key which will actually fit. So to get this barrel out, it's actually fairly straightforward. I've stripped off the back of the switch just so I can keep it intact. There's two little screws, just here, which go on the back of the switch plate there and hold it onto the body, which screw into the back of the body on here. Then inside the body you've got this plate, which sits on like that, and this controls the back of the arms and stuff. You've got some little spring recesses and stuff like that on the shaft, which are on here, which are sitting on my desk right now. Little spring cams, these little things here. Okay, so this was actually on the back of that switch piece, in the bit on here. Okay, there's some holes on the sides. You can just see the hole there. There's one each side, which go in that. Okay, and that obviously just goes into the back of this, on this assembly here, and that is then the switching mechanism. Okay, for the actual light, it sort of pops into place, the detents. You know, when you get this switch out, it's actually fairly easy. There's a locking nut on the back there, you just loosen it off, and then you can actually, it takes tension off, and then you can unscrew the front bezel one without having to dig into it or anything. All right, and then you can just take the thing out the back. All right, but to get the actual barrel out, once you've got this plastic piece here out, which you can hook out with a screwdriver or something, which is what I just did anyway. Screwdriver in here and just popped it out. And then the back of the barrel is sticking through there. And what you actually get is this brass disc here. You have to release that brass disc. And you have to have something in here pushing these pins. Because otherwise the pins will get caught on the front of the channels here. Because there is a undercut on here and it will catch on it. You have to have something in there to push those pins down. It doesn't have to be the right key, it just has to be something to push the pins. All right? You just have to shove something in there. Now, I actually happen to have a lockpick set. All right, I do actually have one. Um, different ones. And this is this one's a rake, you can just shove it in there and run it back into fours and it'll, you know, by luck, it will work. Of course, you can also do things like the eventual proper levers as well. You get those picks quite, quite easily. So I've, used, I've actually picked it a few times and you did the switch a few times manually using those picks and also got a mechanical one as well which um, is a cheat's way <laughs> can be quite quick if it works anyway not like it really matters to do something like this handy little tools to have occasionally if you need to work on locks like this so the disc actually goes through and it pops into the back there you can see it there and all you gotta do is leave it a disc out the way and have something in the barrel obviously you say this key won't work on this one it doesn't suit it all right but you just got to put that disc out of the way, and then you can slide the barrel out. That's what's retaining it. Now some locks actually have a disc like this somewhere else. It's not actually on the back of the barrel sometimes. Right, there you go. So that's popped forward now. And now I can pull it out. So sometimes actually it's in the back of the barrel, and you can get to it from the front. Sometimes you can stick a pick in and just lever it and pull the whole barrel out without even having the key. Not very secure lock size ones, but I've come across them. Usually very cheap, rubbishy locks, so but this one's also got the thing on the back. So let's see you get the barrel out, it's pretty easy. But I thought I'd just show you that. Maybe you're curious. No, not locksmith or anything like that. Just I've got some gear because I thought, right, well, sometimes it'll be handy to be able to pull locks apart and try and fix them. Or you know, re-key and that sort of stuff, my own gear. Having to pay a lot of money for someone else to do it. And uh, it just comes in handy. But yeah, this you can see the pins are not too bad. They're, they're out slightly, but they're not out by a lot. This key would almost do it, you know. If I put that key right in there, just those two pins there, I, mean, I could almost just file those off and this key would work. But I'd rather try and keep it intact if I can. If I can figure out exactly what the key heights need to be, maybe I could, um, maybe I'll go and get another one of these particular keys cut, get a spare one done, and then machine my spare key. And then I've got a key which might fit both my Datrons. Actually, I might just go and see if it's will fit in the other one as well. Well, the key fits into the Datron lock, but I won't turn it on, on my other unit. So, yes, it's definitely the right kind of key for these things. 
So it may be worth investing a bit of time and actually getting a key made. Get a one which actually work on his locks, and maybe then I could flick a few on eBay or something. I don't know. I'm sure someone else has already thought of that. So here's basically the switch put back together again. I'm just going to reassemble it for the time being. Now I've had a bit of a look inside, and here's like a disc. So I thought all oh, that mechanism back together again, really, all our spring parts. What we have on the back of here is just the actual switch itself. It's the switch wafer, and this has got a dual flat shaft on here. So you just make sure the shaft is pushed into here in well one of the orientations, and it will be correct. That will get that back together. Let's go put the spacers back in there and reassemble it all. It's pretty simple really, it's not hard at all. So you've got these screws and these spacers which go, the screws go through the back of the switch, an actual wafer, then you've got the spacer that goes in front of the wafer and onto the body to space it off. So yeah, easy enough. Okay so there's a switch wafer there with the bolts through, let's go put the spacers on the front. And of course my hands are in the way, but you know, I have to live that from it. There you go, there's one spacer. And where's the other spacer gone? It was there just now. Seriously, where's it gone? How does that happen? There it is. Right. That space on there as well. Shut down the screw. And then we can put the switch assembly on. So what I'm going to do is just to help ensure that it all doesn't fall apart is stick that on there like that. It's that wafer which holds the back of the switch together. Which you can't see because it's out of focus at this distance. I'm going to shove this through here and try and get the switch wafer lined up, which you can't see because everything's way too close, of course. Right. So let's get this one screw right here lined up. Going in, get the other one lined up and going in. Obviously it won't fall apart then. There you go. It's going back together. Well, I did this really because I wanted to have a look and see how it's actually put together educational kind of thing, you know, no harm in having a look. I like to pull things apart and figure them out. See how they go together. See if I can modify it, because I like to keep things intact if I can, so the fact that I actually know what key I need, and in fact it's close enough for me to just get a copy made and get it um, changed slightly once I get it back, I'll file it back down and um, do that. But uh, that's all in place. And you can see the switch mechanism right here, it's in the correct place. Could have been 180 degrees out, that's the risk there, but obviously I didn't get it wrong this time. I'll take this bezel back off and refit this back in place. Does it actually have a keyed system on it? It does, isn't it? Yeah. That's like a washer, which I've got in the wrong place. The whole switch is upside down. Oh, I've got the whole thing upside down. <laughs> well, it, it'll probably go anyway. It's fine. It'll be fine. What could possibly go wrong? Yeah. I've actually got that switch plate back upside down. So I'm going to have to change that so it gets the right way up. So I'll, fi I'll fix that then I'll come back. Okay, I took the whole wafer back off. Turned the whole thing around 180 degrees. And then put it back on again. Nothing too exciting there. And that'll now go in and sit in the right place. Now I'm going to put this bezel washer back on. Anyway, so that is interesting. I thought I'd just have a look at that and see that comes out. And so that's screwed down tight there and it's loose because I'll do the nut up on the back there. But, uh, yeah, so I might see if I can get a key made for this rather than butchering this assembly, but it's still possible to change it out to something else. I mean, I could even just use this blanking hole here and put a hole in it and put a toggle switch in. I mean, doesn't matter that much. So the next question is, can this key which almost fits right be used to make it turn on? Sometimes you can just wiggle them around a little bit and get enough out of them. It's like, not quite. I know it's just around there somewhere. It doesn't quite go. It's getting stuck. Yeah, it doesn't quite go. Not quite there, it's close. I can just feel it's almost there. That's a shame. So anyway, I'm going to have to look at getting a key made then. I think if I just get this one copied and just take these two high spots off, make them about half the height, I think they'd be pretty close. Yeah. Oh, that's fine. 
capacitors are turned up so I can do the final two on the front of here. So that's then all of those electrolytics replaced and I can move on and check other things. Also the new Otto couplers have arrived. Uh, that's not that one. No, the MC26, here we go. So this is the opto coupler I need to, to replace this one which is missing. So once I've got those capacitors replaced and an opto coupler installed, we can actually have a better go and see what happens. See if we need closer to get anything working. Make sure you subscribe, click the bell icon, that sort of stuff as well. It always helps the channel. Gives a thumbs up, definitely helps. And have a chat down below in the comments as well, because I want to hear your opinions. If you've got any experience with these things, any advice you can give me, I'm certainly open to advice. Certainly don't know everything. And I've got a lot to learn about these particular units. I'm not that familiar with them yet. I'm gradually getting there, but I've got a lot to learn. So if you've got any experience with these things, then I'm certainly you know, interested in hearing from you, especially. Equally, if you've got any good ideas, just let me know. You know, If you see me doing something stupid, by all means, say it down below. Right, let's get on with this thing. So the first thing I'll do is get this board out before I can do anything else to it. So I'll lift these out. I think this unit's got no battery. I'm waiting for batteries to arrive, so I can't do calibrations on it um, until I can get those batteries turned up. I mean, RS wouldn't sell them to me. Well, I, wouldn't, I couldn't get it from RS, I think it was. Yeah, Element 14 comes from Australia, so they couldn't ship it. So that was equally as useless. So I can I can't only get the battery from China. That's ridiculous. I can't get it from Australia, but I can get it from China, because that makes total sense. Anyway, never mind. Let's make sure these are popped up. Right, I think they're all out. Yeah. There we go. So I've just got to lift these ones out, compress these, and get this board lifted out. Uh, get something to squeeze it with. There we go. I think that's it. Oh, there's one more over here behind this wire. There we go. Right. There we go. Let's get this thing worked on. There's something I need to do with this board, or at least some of the parts that are on it, is figure out which parts I'm going to replace. Maybe just as a matter of course. So I've got MCT sixes here. So there's five of them across there. We've got an ICT or ILCT six here, which is basically the same part. That looks original because it's got a dot on it, orange dot. And then over here we've got another MCT six here up the top. And then over here we've got the six N one three sixes, which have got white dots on them. Now this is one of the things I'm not completely sure about. Now I've purchased different items. I've got different brands of these different devices. So these are the that's the MCT six. I've got a few different brands of each one, a few different variants. That's a 16 136 there. There's another one there. And these are different brands. So the specs are very slightly different. So what I'm thinking, I've, I've got a, a selection so that if one particular brand doesn't work quite right, um, I can change to a different one. It may not matter at all. It may be now that the manufacturing tolerances of these particular parts are so tight now that it doesn't really matter. But I know that on the original design, they actually specified they did selections on these devices. So these ones over here are supposed to be, you know, it's got an orange dot and these ones have got white dots on which means that these are the higher spec ones, I think, the faster ones. So there's little things like that where there's some differences between the device, even though it's the same device, it's different. So that's just something to bear in mind is that the speeds can be a factor because it's about synchronizing the digital pulses through the system and if the pulses arrive at slightly different times it can cause problems. What I need to figure out, perhaps someone can give me some decent advice on this if one of you already know this. On these auto couplers, is there an easy way of testing them? Apart from obviously chucking a voltage into them and seeing the output. Right? I want to test the speed and efficiency of them. Um, there's specs about them and their speeds and things like that in the, in the data sheets. But I, I think I can probably just literally just shove a voltage in off a voltage source like um, a signal generator of some kind like a square wave output or something. Of a low enough voltage to trigger the LEDs, um, probably put like a, um, a load resistor on there or something as well, just to cushion it slightly in case I overload an LED. I think it's rated 1.1 volts or something like that for the LEDs inside them. I think they are. I have to double check that, forward voltage. And then it's basically got a transistor output. I know I could basically copy the Datron design here with these resistors and use that as a guide for the currents and, and how quickly they switch. But, Measuring all that lot together at one time, I'm not sure about my 
ability to measure it accurately. I could be able to do it fine, I'm dry. But if anyone's got any experience about measuring these in, in a certain way, actually getting meaningful results from them, please let me know. Because I want to actually do comparisons on these. I'd like to measure all the original devices and make a note of what they all are. And then I've got then a, a reference point for whether the new ones are better or worse. And then if I've got the worst devices, I can put them into the places which are both the red dots, for example, and that sort of thing. I may just be overthinking. I may just be chucking any device and it'll just work because the modern devices are maybe better. You know, this is 30 years old, this thing. So the specs now for what they make is probably tighter. I really don't know, but that's why they got the, maybe that's why they got these selected values because maybe back then they weren't as good at making good quality autocouplers and so they had to sort them out and work out which ones to put where. You know, put the better ones in the most important places. Maybe that's what they did, I don't know. I may just be able to slap anything in it will work. But I, I would sort of like to test and just do some comparisons and actually try and measure the efficiency of these things and see how quickly they switch and that sort of stuff. So I actually then, I know for sure, I forgot one which is a bit weak, I can just replace that one. Rather than just doing like a blanket replacement, I mean I've got the parts to do a blanket replacement, but I'd rather not do that. It just seems a bit silly if I don't need to do it. Although that said, I did need to do it with capacitors, but you know, capacitors are, as far as I'm concerned, consumable items. You know, capacitors do fail, they are, to me they're consumables. So anyway, I'm waffling again. Four minutes of waffling. Let's replace these caps. Right, so the first thing I'll do is put some fresh solder on these. I've already replaced the other four as I mentioned before. I'm just going to use this thicker stuff for now because I'm only just doing this bit. So let's just get some fresh solder on it. And I should get my fan going, shouldn't I? Because that's a bit stupid doing soldering without the fan. Let's do that. And I'll get my desoldering gun and suck the solder out. She always uses my straight turf again. Noisier, but better for your health. It's going to be noisy. Yeah, let's block up. I think it's blocked. Hold on a second. Okay, I think I left this too long to clean it. It's a bit full. Hmm, I think that'll do it. Okay, back in business. Let's carry on. So on these, we've got these little ferrites or something on these leads which we also have to get off. Alright, so those little beads, we've got to take those off as well. So it's not quite desoldered that one. Because of the thing not being perfectly clean at the time. It'll come off, this one's coming. Little beads off, there's one, two, three, four. Okay, I've still got them all. Haven't lost any. It's kind of important. Well, I don't know if it is important or not. They're on there for a reason, I'm guessing. Alright, that's both of those. I'll check those in a minute, out of circuit. And here's the new caps. So, slide the beads on. Try and get them in there just so the markings are visible. Always like to try and do that. Always double check the polarity. Always. It's nothing like putting a electricity capacitor in backwards. That's always an exciting moment. Or well, troubling one because you go, oh, why isn't it working right? And, oh, what's that smoke? Right. That stays on there. Markings visible. Solder those in. Let's use the other solder, which one's slightly better. This is very similar, but it's got a bit of silver in it. I'll keep going about this solder. It's just solder, really, but anyway. Keep going on about it. Try and get the chance to get the right through the board. Same in this one. You can usually see when it's going through because the um, the level of the solder blob will just drop. We see it bubbling or something, you know. I think we might just make sure these capacitors are pushed down as well before I finish it. Right. Let's make 
sure they're all seated down. Yep. 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 Yep, that's all fine. Let's check the top side. I'll cut these off now and put here, I suppose. I'll clean up in a second, once I'm sure it's right. Yeah, that's all right. Let's get this thing cleaned up. I'm not going to bother recording that. I'll keep it clean. I'm sure you'll trust me, I'll do it. Now I've lost the remote control. Here it is. Okay, so let's measure these caps. I've already got my visual ones here. These are what I've just put in. So these are 1.6 ohms, 37 microfarad at 100 hertz. Dissipation. 0 0.03, 0 0.04 pretty much. Okay, let's get this one. Do it any other way, just because I like to do it the right polarization. 0 0.07 and 33 microfarad. ESR. 3.2, so that's a lot higher. Almost double. Here's the other one. ESR 7.8. That's really bad. Uh, 29 microfarad. And dissipation is... 0.7. So yes, so both those caps are definitely far worse than what I just put in. Yep, they need a changing, all right. If in doubt, change them out. Okay, let's put the ball back in again. You notice I'm touching the chassis before I touch the board inside it. Make sure I get the orientation correct and everything. This has to be this right way around. Just need to make sure I don't pop those wires underneath or anything. So I get those posts on there. I'm not aware of anything else which needs fixing on this board, at least not yet. So it could be something. I just don't know what it is yet. It's entirely possible. But for the time being, I'm not going to latch it down. I'm just going to put it in place. Let's make sure it's bedded down and just use these posts here to hold it down like it was before. Connect everything. And then I shall grab a MCT6. We'll pop it in. And we'll fire it up and see if it actually works any differently. Um, I don't expect to get much in the way of sensible reading right? because it's not calibrated, so the values are going to be gibberish. Um, so I think that's everything in in the correct places. GPB still not plugged in. I've lost it. <laughs> Is it? MTT6, there we go. Random chip, let's grab this one. No particular reason I chose this one, let's grab this one. Okay, still touching chassis and stuff, so I'm going to put in one of those. And in that location, it goes this way up. I think I've got the correct chip. I bet I should actually double check this. I'm pretty sure it's MTT6 on here. Yeah, I'm 90% sure that's the chip I needed. And now I need to check because I've got doubts in my mind. Let me double check before I power this thing up. Okay, that's confirmed. That is an MCT6. Well, equivalent. It's supposed to be an FCD880, but an MCT6 is an equivalent. And that's what's been used in other places on the board here. So, yep, that's in. Let's power this thing up and see if we get any life. Let's see how lucky we get, shall we? Now, I was getting an error on here. Um, apparently, it's to do with the four wire being turned on into a test. So, I'm going to put it on a two wire. Right, so we're ready to go. Power's on at 214 volts. Should be high enough. Let's see what happens. Hmm. Okay. Different. Let's do a test. Volts, ohms, both passed. AC fails calibration. So I did volts, ohms, and AC. Three boards didn't report errors, but calibration failed. I know that because there's no battery and there's no calibration data. Hey, this is looking good. Okay, we're getting a interesting value on the screen. AC volt zero, kilo ohms, should be open. Error, OL. Um, that might be fine because there's nothing in it. Let's short the terminals out. Yeah, shove the tweezers in here. See if that will bring anything up. Oh, look at that. Put my five kilo ohms. Oh, look 
at that, it's working. Filter. More digits, yes. That's working. Okay, it's gonna be nonsense values I expect. We should have a proper load in this and actually do a measurement on some resistors and see if it's working kind of right or not, but zero looks close. Okay, well, let's give this a go. I have, somehow on DB now, I must have pushed the button. Okay, I'm using this resistance box here. I could have my resistance calibrator, my Fluke 5450A. Could use that, but I'm just doing rudimentary testing right now, not calibration, so let's just see how it goes. So this set zero right now, I think zero. And we're getting 0.29 ohms. Yeah, maybe, may or not be right, I don't know. So let's do one ohm. Okay. Ish, 10 ohms, 2, 4, 5, 6, and a half, finally, it is 6 and a half digits, it just wasn't displaying ever when I was trying to do other testing, so yes, it is doing 6 and a half digits, great, that's a, that's a relief, I was a bit worried that the digital board was swapped out with a 5 and a half digit one, so that's fine, I was a bit worried about it before, waffled on about that for a while, so that's doing 10 ohms, and well, it's just 13, so I'm not worried about the actual values right now, So that's 100 ohms to 131. I was checking for basic functionality. Okay. So um, 1k is giving about 5, floating around quite a bit. That looks rather unstable. That could be an autocoupler problem. Do 10k, comes out as 41, 61, 81, 100. Yeah, that's not right, is it? Let's do 1000 or 1 meg. Doesn't work. So I'm doing 100k now, and that's drifting around our place too. And do 10 meg. If I turn the input filter off, does that change anything? So it's definitely got a problem of some kind with a couple of ranges. So whether those ranges are switching correctly or whether it's um, something else going on with these couplers, I don't know. I could just swap them out and just see what happens. See if swapping anything changes anything. I could do this in a logical way and actually look at the circuitry and so on figure out which bit is doing what but that may not really be necessary. So, but then the calibrations are out as well, but it shouldn't be drifting, even if it is out of calibration, it shouldn't really be doing that weird behavior there. Yeah, I'm on 1K right now, and it's just doing this, drifting upwards. This is definitely, yep, yeah, it's definitely on two wire. I'll go back to 1K again. Let's just wiggle the switch around. Hmm, that's interesting. What's it given that? In four wire. Four wire is not looking right. Okay, so we've definitely got some more stuff to fix. So, which range is particularly bad? Those are definitely reading differently. This is looking more likely to be correct. So I think 1k upwards is dodgy. So those are looking stable. So yeah, there's definitely something going on here. It could be some calibration with he's doing. It could be someone's been playing with it and it's out of calibration and it's been a bit wacky because of that. Or it could be something else going on. I mean, I've already replaced, I've already done the power supply stuff and that's all definitely good. So no, that's not a problem. So, hmm. Okay. Just in case it's that. I doubt it though. That's a 10k setting. Ah, huh. that is now correct. Was it really the guard that's doing it? 
it was the guard. I didn't like having the guard and a negative time together. Huh. <sighs> I'm chasing something that's actually not wrong. That's okay. Okay, let's do this again then. So this is with the guard just connected to the other end. So I connected to one end. So that's through 100 ohms again. That looks pretty good. Yep. 1k. Yep. Excellent. It's doing something all the way up so far. 10k. Yep. Now this one's wrong. This should be 0 0.01 mega ohm. Not 0 0.1, so that's definitely wrong there. Okay. But that one's okay. That one's alright. That one's alright. 100k. Yep. Yep. And wrong. So mega ohms is wrong. Uh, it could be a dodgy relay. There's. There are some relays over here. But it may more likely be on the ohms board itself rather than the analog board. So, so 10 mega ohms looking a bit dodgy. But then maybe it requires four wire for that. Maybe. I doubt it though. Excellent. We're getting there. So let's do something like 900. Yeah, that's okay. That's, yeah. So it is reporting something. I'm actually quite surprised by that since there's no calibrations. So that's not bad. Just shove some voltage into it. Right, I'm injecting four volts and I've just switched it on right before I pushed the button and I'm getting four volts on display. It's, it's actually bloody working. That one's out of spec. But still, those are working. Let's drop this down. Let's do one volt. Power supply is fairly close. It's only a couple of millivolts out, I think, most of the time. So let's do one volt. Yeah, so this is definitely out of calibration very slightly. But that's not surprising. Let's do 100 millivolts. Here we go. That's there too. Well, excellent. That's looking a bit off. Yeah, see, it's definitely a bit screwy. There's that weird value there. Probably a zeroing problem with the calibrations on this analog board, I'm guessing. Uh, okay, input filter. Okay, 106. 106. What does Mr. EV blog say? One oh four. Cool. So we're back in auto ranging. Let's do five volts. Four nine nine five volts. There we go. So yep, yeah, it's definitely kind of right, but it's obviously way out of whack because the calibration's been gone. I haven't tried doing things like resetting the calibrations. I mean, there's a short a jumper plug thing here. You short that out to wipe it. I haven't done that. In case there's a chance that maybe the calibrations are still just sitting there, not wiped. But I'll, it based on how far out it is, I doubt that's the case. So great, we've got it measuring ohms and resistances mostly, and most of the, the voltage range is also reading. That's brilliant. Let's go a bit higher. I should just change this to volts, shouldn't I? Anyway. Let's go 1 point, well 10.5 volts, here we go, 2, 4, 6 and a half digits, excellent. And we'll check the voltage here, 10.51 and 10.56, so it's basically working. Well that's great isn't it, it's 90% there. So I really need to figure out what's going on with these upper ranges. Um, that's reading incorrectly. That's just completely garbage. So it's doing something, but it's garbage. 
So I need to figure out what's going on with these upper ranges on resistance and voltage and uh, go from there. But that's pretty pleasing. Also I need to do four wire tests as well to verify that's working. Let me grab another cable. Okay, I've got it set up for four wire now, just very roughly. Um, I've used a different guard terminal this time, unless this one's got Mott's Ohm's guard. So I've hooked into that one instead. So I've got auto ranging, currently got this shorted out. Or was a jumper, so let's do 100 ohms. Down to 900, yep, that's all right. Let's do 1k. Yep. 10k. Yep. 100k. Alright, can I go above 900 to get that range to change? Oh, come on. No. <laughs> um, so that's 1027, that range 1125, and a bit unstable, but then it could be noise and stuff. So it's back down to 900 again. I'll go down to say 600. Get okay, silver on four there. Here we go, 617 to a filter. There you go. Nice and stable. Takes like an average, I think. Rolling average, I think that's what it does. Do the same on this one. I want to see if this one's stable. Ish. Yep, that's looking pretty stable. So. But something's still not right there, obviously, with that even 4 wire, 2 wire, it's even the same kind of thing. This top range isn't reading right, but it is at least working. Made some decent progress. So I suppose what I could try next is doing a input 0 to see if that triggers an alert. Now sometimes it will do a error 4. I noticed that previously when I pushed that button, so I haven't tried that again yet. So let's see what that does now. Well, it zeroed. So, okay. Cool. Zero that one. Yep. Should try trying each range, not in case it matters on a particular range. That zeroed. No errors so far. This is looking very promising. Okay, can I do the same thing with DC volts? This one's a bit wacky. Can I zero that one? I can. Okay. This is looking good. I see. No zero on AC. Maybe that's not an option. I don't know if that's supposed to work on AC or not. Um, let's do the filter. Try again. No. Okay, so. It is indeed doing something. I don't know about the rest of this stuff. I, uh, it's got all kinds of extra features which I've got no idea about. I haven't even looked into any of them. My focus has been trying to get this thing working and this looks like it is 90% there. So I'm pleased with that. I'm thinking that I may look at optocouplers though. I still think I've got an optocoupler problem with that ranging looking a bit weird up here on the um, killer arms range. Still think something's not right there. Mind you, it's retained the zero now. Go back here, still zero. I 
think I'll lose it when I power it off, won't it? It's only a temporary thing. Kill items. Yep. It's still zeroed. Oh, cool. Alright then. Even more progress. So what I think I really need to do now is wait until I get this battery arrive, then I can get that fitted. Once that's here, then I can at least go on and finish calibration off. I've done no calibration work apart from power supplies and this L2 adjustment over here for the PO lock. Those are the only things I've done. So I do need to look at checking the calibration out, making sure it's okay, and then I can do a proper calibration and getting those values set properly, but it's looking pretty good so far.